Look, we know you hate paying for your licence, but hey, you have to do it anyway. So why not take advantage of some of the free benefits you can get with QBCC? So find out more when the Commissioner joins the show today. Welcome to the Tradies Business Show, helping you get off the tools and into true business ownership so you can spend more time doing the things that matter most. Now, here are your hosts, Warwick Bidwell and Michaela Clark. So g'day listeners, welcome back to another episode of the Tradies Business Show. In case you don't know, my name's Warwick from Tradies Business Toolkit and with me I have... Michaela from Tradies VA. And uh, Michaela's in another part of the country again. You seem to get around a lot, don't you, Michaela? Oh, I know. That's what happens when you're a national company. <laughs> I like it, I like it. Thank goodness for modern technology, hey? So we're uh, yes. we're going to do a quick intro to today's interview. Uh we were lucky enough to catch up with Steve Griffin, the commissioner of the QBCC recently. And uh, as you said in the, the little teaser to the show, Michaela, it's, um, the organisation has changed, hasn't it? It really has. And, you know, there's some amazing benefits about getting payments chased and, and help with uh, contracts and, and client things. So we uh, have realised lately that a lot of our clients don't really understand all the benefits that are there for them um, and how easy it is to access them now, which is things like their 24-hour, um, seven-day-a-week phone line. So we thought best to get um, Head Honcho, the commissioner on the show, and, yes, we were on our best behaviour. Uh, <laughs> I even and, wore a long sleeve shirt. Yeah. <laughs> he was in a suit. We were a little bit more casual, <laughs> but, hey. <laughs> hey, we represent the tradies, okay? That's right. We didn't wear thongs, so, no. hey, we're ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But it was a good interview, and uh, uh, as I said, we'll keep this intro short. Um, but he was a hell of a nice guy. That was something that, that uh, I mean, I shouldn't be surprised, and I'm sure you're going to listen, Steve. So uh, well done, mate. Uh, I was very impressed, um, and it was good just to have a yarn. Uh, he really is very passionate about um, helping Queensland's licensed contractors, uh, all 83,000 of them. So... Um, I was very, uh, very encouraged coming away from this interview. Yeah, and it just goes to show to, you know, having a bit of an open here and really listening to the industry and how they can make changes now. So it's really changed from the old days of the BSA. So enjoy the interview. Let's go. So we're sitting here with uh, Steve Griffin, the Commissioner of the QBCC. Uh, so welcome to the show, Steve. Thanks, Warwick and Mikhail. Good to talk to you. Yeah, absolute pleasure to be uh, speaking with you, mate. So can you tell us a bit about uh, the QBCC and uh, perhaps, you know, your, uh, I guess, journey to get to the position you're in? Yeah, look, um, the QBCC itself has only been around just over 12 months now. Um, it was born out of the former Building Service Authority, which everyone in the industry in Queensland knows about. Um, it was a parliamentary inquiry back in 2012 that suggested that we needed to change the organisation. And that all happened, started to happen in December last year with the creation of the QBCC. So um, along with those changes, there's a new structure of how the business operates. Uh, it has a board, uh, it's a statutory authority, and that board can act independently uh, from the minister uh, and make decisions and act in a very agile way and make changes to the industry that are to the benefit of, of the industry itself. Um, so uh, in more recent times, I think over the last year, I think a lot of people in the industry would have seen a lot of changes happen very quickly. And I think that's a testimony to the fact that we've got a new structure with a board who actually can very quickly give direction to the Commission based upon what they're hearing from the industry and the feedback and make good decisions about change, change that's going to benefit uh, the industry as a whole. Um, the big thing, uh, I guess the big uh, mindset for, uh, for the whole of the QBCC is, as we say, give people peace of mind. So everything we do is about giving uh, people in the industry either work in it or deal with it, peace of mind that they're going to have a good outcome. Be it if I'm a tradie uh, working for a builder, they're going to get a good, good outcome, I'm going to get paid at the end of the day. Mm. Or if I'm a consumer, then I'm going to get a good product, uh, be it a renovation or a new build. So um, that's where that's foremost in our thinking, and also in our thinking is uh, because the construction, building, structure sector is such a big part of the economy that we want to get out of the road of the of the sector and allow it to grow uh, and develop and provide more employment opportunities, develop new skills, get ready for the future, rather than being uh, I guess tying it up in bureaucratic red tape. 
So people have already started to see that we've started to uh, remove some of that red tape, uh, getting rid of things like uh, minimal financial requirements for licensing and all those annual audit returns and so forth, and moving to something where you can more easily get on with your job, be more supportive, provide you with the information and tools you need to grow your business. So it sounds to me uh, much more like a business model than you know, the old school uh, bureaucratic model. I mean, that's, that's really what you're describing, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, one of the, I guess one of the directions we set for ourselves is to be unlike government. Um, we certainly are running the QBCC like a business because uh, we do have an insurance scheme that we run and, 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 and licensing revenue that we need to uh, use wisely And because uh, we are self-funding. We don't need any contribution from government and the general taxpayer. Um, and so we need to use that money wisely, invest it, and invest it for the future, and, and then put that back into the industry. So we're doing that. So we are running on a, a business model, but we're also being more in tune with the industry. At the end of the day, um, whilst the members of the board that are builders, uh, I'm not a builder. I've got a son who's an electrician, but um, it's not for us to dictate to industry how it should grow and develop. It's our job to listen to industry get its feedback about how it's evolving, how things are changing, how things are happening in the real world, not in the, in the sort of quasi sort of unreal world of, of bureaucracy, and actually come up with good policy and good, and good services that make sense to people yeah. um, in, the, in the industry that's going to support their business and let them grow, uh, reduce defects, re- re- reduce disputes, and allow people to get paid when they need to get paid. Yep, yep. Yeah, so I know um, my husband is a trade in a, a licensed trade and he's found even in the last 12 months a big difference in, in dealing with this and getting his licence and the whole yep. process is a lot easier. Yep. And I know there's a lot of new services that you've brought on board as well. Yep. So tell us a little bit more about some of the new services that you're offering now. Yeah, yeah. Michaela thinks we're, we're really pleased to be delivering a lot uh, more and new services uh, and free services to, to tradies and, and to builders and all contractors. And, and I think foremost is the free dispute resolution service. So... Previously, um, the former organisation would not get involved in disputes until the contract had been terminated, and that's just way too late. Mm. Um, so we get involved very early on, uh, and it can be commenced by the consumer or the trade. It doesn't really matter. Either, either party can commence the process. It's as simple as going online and filling out an online form and being it's done or making a phone call to our 24-7 phone service and commencing the process. We commit to getting out there within 10 business days and completing the whole thing within 28 um, and so that's a, a free service. We'll come out, and often it's a case of customers aren't happy what they got, uh, think they got what they paid for. They're not paying their paying their progress or final payment. We come out and say to the customer, "Look, you really have got what you paid for. You should pay." Uh, or we say to the trader, "You know, you do have to fix." And more often not, ninety six percent of the time we're in agreement that you know you go and fix this little bit up, and the customer will pay. Yeah. So we're getting a lot of success out of that. And the real benefit is it keeps the consumer and the tradie out of, out of the court process and tribunal processes, which are very top costly and time-consuming. Whilst it's relatively cheap to lodge in the tribunal, it, it, your own time and money, and if you have to get a lawyer, even more money. And, you know, if you're running a small business, you, if you're owed a lot of money, you can't have that going on for 18 months, two years. Yep. That's right. uh, you need that money in your bank account you know, pretty soon. So we love the fact that we can get out there. Within a month, we can resolve that dispute 90, 95% of the time for you um, and let you move on with your life and the customer move on. A lot of consumers that you know you'll deal with in industry might only deal you know, once or twice in their lifetime, so they don't really know, uh, as much as we try to educate them, they don't really know um, they've got what they're paid for and, and so forth. And so our job is to come out there and we've got a new guide to stands and tolerances, which... Um, we give to customers to say, look, this is really the end outcome because they, they watch the block or they, or they watch. <laughs> you know, God forbid. What are you yeah. saying? You can't do a unit in two days. Yeah. Why yeah. not? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Scotty Kim. Thanks. Yeah. Well, that's fine. Totally pretty. But um, it, at the end of the day, they, they, and they go to showroom displays and, and it just um, creates this false expectation. And mm. It's a matter of, like, with all customer service, it's about setting the right customer expectations. So... When we go out, it's about us um, mediating and making sure the customer's got the right expectations. They know what they've got, what they've paid for, and they, then they resolve those disputes. Um, other free service that we offer is an internal review service. So if we make a decision um, not to give you a licence or an upgrade or refine you or whatever, you can get a, seek an internal review of that decision. So again, it's stopping you from having to go straight to, to 
QCAT into court. So, yeah. again, uh, that's a huge thing. So if, you, if something goes wrong, you can get it dealt with very quickly within, again, 28 days and you can move, move on with your life. Uh, another real big uh, uh, winner since since October, we've been providing a free service for those those um, tradies that aren't getting paid, um, subcontractors aren't getting paid by their principal contractor, um, and we've been really successful now. I think we've recovered something in the order of about two point four five million dollars for tradies who weren't getting paid by the head contractor since October. So even that short period of time, wow. we've been very successful. We changed the regulation. Um, and so we can, we have the power now to go to those principal contracts and say, hey, why didn't you pay Steve for that work he did? And if they've got no real good legitimate reason, then we can suspend and then ultimately cancel it. And that threat of suspension cancellation obviously creates a, a fracture point for someone to make a decision on whether they're yeah. going to pay or not. That doesn't stop, you know, a le- legitimate bes- cyber claim or whatever that if there is a reason why the payment shouldn't go ahead, mm-hmm. then there are obviously the cyber or the court system and uh, yep. to go through, but there's still a lot of people in the industry not paying just for the sake of not paying, uh, increasing their bottom, you know, their top yep. line at the, at the, you know, I guess the chagrin of the, of the, of the tradie. Mm. Um, so we're very pleased with providing that free service. Again, it's simple as going onto our website, filling in a smart form, and we can start that process for you. So if you're a tradie out there not getting paid after you've completed a job, and please contact us and fill in what we call a money's owed form. Um, there's always forms with government, but we try to <laughs> stream on them. They're not a physical form you have to fill out. They're actually electronic form. And put that in, or you can, as I said earlier, you can ring 24-7 phone. We'll fill it in for you uh, and get that process started, and we'll start to try and get your money for you. Because it is something that, uh, and I'm sure everyone's got a horror story that, that they can share, but um, so many people don't realise that, that service perhaps is available and, and they sort of feel like they're at wit's end when they're not getting paid by their principal contractor and yep. you know the, the chances of getting debt collection uh, services to, to recover the money are pretty slim with some of the big companies that they deal with. So. Yeah, it is and, and, and sometimes it's not really economic to get yeah. a debt recovery person if you only own a few thousand, but a few thousand a year might mean a lot. That's right. Um, so, you know, that's where we become handy. Again, we provide that service free. You're already paying your license fees, so we want to provide that service to you for free to get. So make sure that people who owe money are getting paid. Okay. Yep. We also run uh, Besiper. We made changes to Besiper at the end of last year. Um, when you made make a, a claim under Besiper, um, then it used to go through to a nominating authorities who would then find someone adjudicator or whatever. We we manage that directly now. So when you come to us again, you go online or, or ring us up. We fill in a, uh, a form, not a, a handwritten one, but we fill in a form for you. Start that process very quickly. Within two days, we allocate a uh, adjudicator, and then they've got 10 or 15 days, depending upon the complexity of the matter, to get the thing resolved. So our whole ethos is to very quickly and seamlessly get people an outcome so they don't have to wait years and months, which was previously the case. You know, people like to go off to tribunals or whatever and yep. be, you know, carrying on a debt for 18 months, two years. It would send a lot of business, small businesses under um, needlessly. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, and that shouldn't happen. That's that's what we, we're trying to safeguard against that happening because we need all the tradies we can get to make sure we can keep on building. Mm, absolutely. And I really love the 24-hour, seven-day-a-week service. I mean, so many traders are on the tools all day during the day, being able to do this stuff on the weekend and nights yeah. and just being available any time. It's so good to have that um, ability to communicate any time that's convenient to them. So. Yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, it's just so wrong, so wrong and um, where um, governments think that people should be available to do business with them when they're ready to do business. And so that's... Totally what we're not about. We're about being open for business when you're open for business. And that is often it's you finish your job, you're getting home, you know, six o'clock or whatever, you're making dinner for the kids and then you eight o'clock and you're tucking into bed, that's when you turn your mind to doing your paperwork or whatever. We want to be open for business at that time. Yeah. Um, and so we've had that service going since the 1st of July and not a lot of people using it. So I've encouraged <laughs> a lot of people to, to ring us up late at night or on Saturday, Sundays. We're starting to get a lot of lot more phone calls and Saturdays because that's when people are starting to contract yeah. in their contracts, yeah. which is great. Yeah. Um, but again, we, we, we 
Uh, open it up to anyone. Ring us anytime. Four o'clock thirty on a Monday morning. If you can't sleep, yeah. ring us <laughs> up and do. If that's the only time you can find to do business with us, then we're open for you to do business. Well, with I reckon you wouldn't be able to hold very long, so it'd be a good time to <laughs> yeah. set your well, alarm the first early. First in the queue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that is that is the benefit of, yeah. of that. Is that yeah? Um, and we're trying to, to reach uh, range where where actually you won't have a queue. So if we can't answer your call within a reasonable, we'll give you a call back. So we don't want you hanging on the phone, even if you're up during a very busy period, say yeah. four or five o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we'll let you call fairly quickly, within 60 seconds. And if, if the wait time's too long, we'll just tell you and say, look, can we ring you back? What's the time that suits you, like three yeah. o'clock tomorrow? And then sort of, we don't want you hanging on the phone and waiting you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes to talk to a bureaucrat. That's not on. It's It's like... We want to serve you at a time that suits you and not waste your time in doing it. Yeah, mm. oh, I love a good mm. callback service. Yeah. yeah. Now, I have to admit, um, just an observation coming into the offices here in Brisbane was, uh, you know, I guess we got attended to by somebody. There wasn't somebody at the counter. Everybody was busy. And somebody went and called for another lady to come out and actually attend to us and uh, find out who we were here to see. So um, I was actually quite surprised because I expected us just to be sitting there waiting for that that one or, or two yeah. customer service people to attend yeah. to us. You know, it was very oh. unlike, a, uh, I guess, the organisation of old Yeah, take a ticket and <laughs> yeah. yeah, look, that's that's not part of our philosophy. Again, uh, your time's precious and we don't want you to waste your time. Um, and again, come and see us um, if we can't deal with on the spot then we'll give you appointment, yeah. appointment time to come in and so you don't have to waste your time that's all part of the service so uh, I guess back to you, the original point what's different about the organisation is that we we are more customer centric and, and customer first is our first principle and so um, and who are our customers everyone's our customer mm. the next person who walks in the door is our customer we don't differentiate we don't segment we say just say the next person who walks in the door is a customer it could be an internal customer it doesn't really matter and so our ethos is all about giving the best service to that person who walks in the door mm. um, and treat them and stand in their shoes and, and own their problem and don't give up on that problem until you've got a resolution to it. Um, it's so easy for, for some customer, and you, you'll see this in various organisations where they're government or private, that they'll just uh, buck pass you to another person. There's nothing worse. And we know some of those organisations where you ring up and they put you, you've been waiting on one queue and they put you in another oh, queue or yeah. another. Um, sometimes you think that's deliberate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They just don't want to deal with the problem. Yeah. yeah. So, Steve, uh, tell us a bit about your background, mate. I mean, uh, you know, obviously you're the leader of a pretty, uh, pretty big organisation here in, in Queensland. Mm. Um, and what, what's a bit, a bit, a bit of your background, and what are you bringing to the table here? Yeah. No, I, um, I've been, I've worked for government for uh, thirty years. Uh, in uh, in March, actually, it'll be thirty years. Um, Queenslander, but but most of, all my career has been in New South Wales. Oh, uh, geez, mate. We, just, we just lost some of our listeners. I think <laughs> just sorry off. about that. <laughs> um, but always a true Queenslander, always a Maroon supporter. Yep. Uh, even though I'm a, a Bunnies born, you know, just love the Bunnies, and I've been a supporter of them since 1971. Nice. But um, yeah, um, it's great to come back to Queensland. I, I've been in a lot of um, major government roles. I, I ran New South Wales Fair Trading, which was the building regulator uh, in in, in um, in New South Wales for, for about a decade. Um, I, I set up a, a new um, government organisation called Service New South Wales that delivers a holistic approach to, to services in New South Wales. So if you're ever in Tweed Heads, drop into the service centre in Tweed Heads and you know what I mean. It's just a different way of serving people and a whole range of services in one place. You know, all, all different government departments jumped into one, one location, one website, one phone call centre and so uh, a lot of those philosophies and ideologies I bought into this business, and um, and I think that that works well. So I bought my regulatory experience um, together with my customer um, service experience and melded those together, and, and that's I guess why the board selected me for the role. Mm. Yeah. And so how do you how do you stay abreast, I guess, of what's happening in private enterprise because you're you're a government or semi-government organisation yeah. that's that's yep. I suppose serving private enterprise, how do you, yeah. how do you manage that? Uh, yeah, no, and, and a lot of my time is devoted to um, stakeholder engagement. So a lot of time, MBO, HIA, MPAC, a whole range of leading stakeholders, but also the individuals themselves, uh, attending a lot of uh, our roadshow presentations, seeing in front of crowds, telling them and they're getting their feedback. 
We also have industry reference groups. So we have an industry reference group and a consumer reference group. are just people that are selected from the industry um, and, and from consumer groups and so forth. So we can get a clear indication of what, what are the issues out there. Yep. We also um, we also do a lot of surveying. So uh, as being part of customer centric, we, we every time you get a service from us, uh, we're sending out um, an email to get a survey monkey from you to find out what your feeling is. Um, we do surveys about a lot of the um, reforms we're thinking about, such as the uh, one we did recently about better payments. Um, so that keeps us pretty well up to date and up to speed with what's really happening. Um, so we're very open um, and engaging uh, with our customers to hear what they've got to say. As I said earlier, um, you know, I'm a long-term bureaucrat. Um, I hate to use that word, but I, I like to think as a, a servant of the public. But um, I'm not here to dictate to the industry how it should run itself. Um, I'm here to deliver for mm -hmm. the industry a, a regulatory framework that it wants, mm -hmm. that it knows it can support and grow the, grow the industry, not dictate to it. Um, and that's the philosophy that I bring to the, to, to the role. Yeah. So with all this feedback and um, being part of the industry, what do you see as some of the the forecast or trends that is going to affect the industry over the next few years? Yeah, look, uh, and there, there are a few clear ones. Um, First of all, um, the I guess uh, the more immediate ones is is the downturn in, in mining sector and, and commercial, and a, a resurgence of, of residential. So the residential market's picked up, the commercials dropped off. Um, so you need to be aware of that and position yourself for that. Um, the future um, is going to require a different skill set. Um, uh, I've got. Young, young, young children, I've got children in their twenties who are probably thinking about buying or building their first home down the track. They won't wait eight to 10, 12 months to build a home. They want it done in six weeks. So uh, what's happening around the world is, is the prefab homes that you chunk together very quickly. That's the way of the future. So completely new skill set, the, the old frame setup that we've been doing for the last 30, 40 years isn't going to be here in a decade's time. It's going to be a it's because your customers, your demographics have changed. Um, they'll, they'll want these homes built very quickly um, and um, they'll, be, they'll be willing to pay for it. So um, different skill sets are going to be required. So if you're a tradie out there, you need to sort of have your antennae up and say, what's happening new out there? Do I need to reskill myself to get ready for the future? And, and being able to, um, you know, a lot of the work's going to be done in factories in the future and hopefully in Australia, not overseas where people work, do a lot of the work prefab in the factory and then it's bought you know, and chunked together in pieces. So you need to either be ready, getting ready for that in the future if you're going to be around 10, 15, 20 years' time to be there or part of the people that put it all together on site. Um, that in high rise, I think, um, certainly a move. Um, the quarter eight acre block thing that we grew up with is, is no longer the van. It's, it's, it's now high rise. People don't want the extra work and the, the yard, the maintenance and all those sorts of things. So... The, the medium to high density living, uh, particularly governments pushing that more to great, greater use of um, you know, urban growth and, and, and development and utilities, that's going to be more in the future. So I think in the resi sector, certainly more um, of that prefab home um, and high rise, medium rise. Um, and so that, that's where you need to be thinking about how can I position myself to take advantage of that in, in 5, 10, 15 years because it's coming. Um, if you look around the world, it's already starting very heavily emerging in Europe and, and Canada, and we tend to be at least four or five years behind those places. So it is coming. We're starting to see it now, and I hate to think that it's going to be thrust upon us and, and people from overseas are going to be just sending us all this stuff and, and sort of we, we should be really at the front of that and lead it ourselves rather than be dictated to by, by people overseas. Because we have local conditions that we and that are different, like we have... Cyclones and <laughs> things like that. We need to make sure that you know the new way we, we're going to build can withstand those cyclone and other floods and other conditions that we're prone to get in Australia. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And so, uh, from a business perspective, I mean, we, we uh, try and put, I guess, uh, content out via the show to help tradies um, get off the tools and into business ownership. Yeah. You, you would obviously see a lot of things being done by people or not being done by people yeah. um, in your role. But uh, yeah. I mean, as an organisation, what what do you see as some of the key 
challenges or gaps in people running a tradie business versus just being a tradie? Yeah, really, um, the, the big big couple of things are, first of all, estimating. Um, people get themselves into a lot of trouble not appropriately estimating the work and then offering quotes and then obviously ending up with a very slight margin. Um, if you if you don't do your estimating, uh, I know it's hard in a competitive market, but if you um, underquote or poorly estimate and, and don't have a profit margin, you're obviously not going to have a very successful um, uh, business long, longer term. So you need to get that right. Um, you also need to get right, at the end of the day, it's a customer service industry. You've got to be customer centric. You've got to be, you can't treat your customers with disdain. You've got to, You've got to have that rapport with your customer. So if you can have a rapport with your customer, they're going to forgive you for not being on time or a bit of delay or whatever. But if you don't develop that customer rapport, then you're behind the eight ball already. So we see time and time again, not enough attention to you know, making sure the customer's expectations are set, they fully understand what the process is and fully engage in good customer service up front. If you spend a bit of time there, you're going to have less trouble down the track. Mm-hmm. And you get your estimating right, you'll make sure you get good profit margin. The, the other element is getting your contracts and any variations to your contracts in writing. There's so many mistakes made by tradies where they, they go, yeah, no, I'll do that for you, I'll do that extra bit. And, and then, because it's not in writing, then the customer turns around, or the principal contractor turns around and says, no, we didn't agree to that. Yep. And they miss out. And again, that erodes their profit margin. And then at the end of the day, they have no profit. You have no profit, you have no business. So, um, we, we really want to see, we're looking at introducing a voluntary CPD next year, or this year rather. Um, and a lot of uh, focus there will be about business develop, those business skills that we need people to develop. So as we know, people come through their trade and apprenticeship and, and they're, they're very good artisans and they're, and, and they're good at what they do. But when it comes to running a business, that's a completely new world to them. And we're happy for them to make that leap and and to get off the tools and so forth and get into business, but it requires a development of a different skill set uh, and a different mindset. Again, it's more customer-centric. It's rather than getting engaged with the customer rather than being arm's length and rather than just being the doer. Um, And as I I was saying to you earlier, there's the emergence of these uh, business tools um, uh, and software that allows you to, to run your business. Be it if you're, in terms of the business information management systems that are coming up that allow you to get rid of the paper plans and make sure you're doing building correctly and also the way you run your business there's software being developed and available mm. where you can actually like the MIAV for finance they allow you to, to run your financial and your invoicing and, and that aspect of your business and give you real good visibility because if you lose visibility you don't know whether you're actually making a profit or not and then if you don't know someone's going to catch up and tell you um, when it's all too late. That's right. Uh, yeah. I don't want it to be us. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was grinning like an idiot there, Steve, because uh, you're talking about the whole business side uh, versus the trade side. And you know, my dad was a builder all his life, great tradesperson, but crap at running a business. Yeah. And so he ended up with not very much yeah. after 40 years of hard work. Yeah. Um, and I also liked the... Uh, the nice uh, plug for our show sponsor, which you don't know anything about, <laughs> but uh, my old pay direct, uh, the little um, smart payment solution, right. is actually our show sponsor. So there's so many great tools out there to help people run a better trade business yeah. that, again, I just they just don't know about. Yeah, yeah. and even um, in episode 23 of the show, we had um, Clinton on from TradiePad that talked all about the software and saving hours every week, and there's so many yeah. solutions out there now that yeah. really the, the paper system's not going to cut it and you're not going to be competitive anymore unfortunately you yeah, know you really right. have to to look at this over the next couple of years of streamlining your systems oh definitely and they're getting cheaper and cheaper so yeah. you know yeah a few years ago they were, they were sort of four or five thousand dollars but now you a few hundred dollars investment yeah. and gets your way ahead of the game um yeah the industry's very competitive and that's great and and we're, we've got to make sure we're getting skilled people coming in um but i'm talking with with uh, construction skills queensland uh, about that very fact that we, we, we're training good people. We, I think we've got a good national training package um, that gets people prepared for the doing mm-hmm. uh, and make sure they comply with, with standards and, and, and the NC's the National Construction Code. But we're not preparing them for, for running a business. And so we need to look at, you know, at the moment, for licensing purpose, we require you to do a business model uh, module in addition to 
you know, apprenticeship, which I don't think is enough. Um, and, class, and so we need to look at other ways that we can make sure that we develop you and your skills to eventually get off the tools and start employing people and running a business. Because mm. uh, ultimately that's the benefit of everybody. Yeah. You're employing more people, you're training more people, and you're earning a good profit and you're letting yeah. your, your family better off yeah. you after your 40 years in the industry that you've got a great legacy you can pass on sell the business and it's a really great business. Um, it's a shame when you hear those stories where people have slogged, hard slog for 40, 50 years and at the end of the day, there's not been much of a heartache to, to, mm. to leave them with because that shouldn't be the way. If, you, if you've worked hard, you know how to build well, you've never had a problem with the commission, you've never had many, you've never had a happy customer, um, you know, you really should be in a, in a good place. Mm. And I'm finding too a trend of a lot of apprentices, you know, are starting their businesses when they come out and finish their certificates and trade. Mm. They're going into business a lot sooner than what used to happen, you know, Five yeah. ten years ago, that they're they're coming out with the skills and with technology and and the way social media is and online marketing that they kind of get that yeah. go into business a lot sooner and there yeah. is that massive gap of mm-hmm. you know they're confident and cocky yeah. a lot of the time but just yeah. that business acumen's not there yeah. great on the tools so there is yeah. a gap there definitely. yeah no there is and we acknowledge that and um, and and we've got a real interest in make sure um, that develops because. Um, we, we run the Home Warrior Insurance Scheme and um, a third of our claims that we get are from when build, businesses collapse and, and builders leave things half completed. And, mm. and so we have a real interest in making sure that businesses do prosper mm. so that we don't have as many claims on the scheme. Look, any, anything like that undermines confidence of the you know, consumers in doing business. When they hear about a, you know, building a builder failing or, and leaving people out of pocket, it just... This, Smirches the reputation of the industry, so we want to minimise on that happening. So, good, smart investment in building people's business capability is, is a key objective of ours. And um, so, as I said, with CPD later this year, we'll be having a real strong focus on business de- uh, management development. Great. So, Steve, one question we often like to ask uh, some of our experts, and, and I don't know if that's really the right term to use here, mate, but. Uh, uh, is if you had a thousand tradies in a room, and perhaps I should say eighty thousand, because that's kind of the numbers that, <laughs> that you guys deal with. But uh, if you had a thousand tradies in the room, what's what's uh, one thing you would like to to share with them? One message you would like to impart upon them? Yeah, look, I'd like to tell them that um, um, use the QBCC services, um, access us twenty four seven. We're there to help support you. We're not there to catch you out. Uh, we actually want to. Make sure you don't get into trouble. We want to make sure you do run a profitable business. So use our services. Come and talk to us. Uh, come in and see us. We've got nine locations throughout the state. Um, and, um, and come and see us and we'll give you the information you need. Um, if you do that, then you'll be much better off. Um, and sort of if there are issues out there, come and let us know as well. So yeah, we're right, open right for business. Come and see us. We're not a you know, big, bad bureaucratic regulator anymore. We want to help you grow your business, so come and talk to us. I love it. And um, best place to find out more about QBCC? Yeah, is, is at our website, uh, qbcc.qld.gov.au, or call us on 139333. Great stuff. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks again for your time, Steve. Oh, you're welcome. Cheers. Thank you. So there you have it, the new QBCC. Thanks again to Steve Griffin. Uh, great interview. Really enjoyed chatting with him, actually, and we, we did chat for quite a bit longer than we recorded. Uh, and uh, I've got a funny feeling we might um, we might catch up with Steve again in the future. One thing I have to say, Michaela, is I, I had to stop myself from having a bit of a chuckle, but we didn't put Steve up to the mention of MYOB in the midst of the interview there. Uh, no, and they are our sponsor, so uh, they have uh, been with us a few episodes now, Mile Pay Direct, which is often some really flexible mobile payment solutions for tradies and those that work on the road. So if you want to find out more, head to tradiesbusinessshow.com forward slash MYOB and all the information can be there. And to make sure you never miss an episode, listeners, go to iTunes find the Tradies Business Show, hit subscribe, but even more importantly than that is go and leave us a review. 
uh, give us a star rating. That's the easy bit. But leave us a review and um, leave us an honest one. We will we'll read some more out in future episodes. And Michaela and I are hatching a cunning plan for uh, some cool stuff that we'll give away to some lucky listeners for submitting a review on iTunes because we do want to get the show out to as many tradies as possible. Bribery. <laughs> I'm okay with it. Uh, Steve, if you're listening, mate, um, we, we don't take bribes, okay? <laughs> Thanks well, again, listeners. See ya. Bye. You've been listening to the Tradies Business Show with Warwick Bidwell and Michaela Clark. Want to get off the tools into true business ownership? Find out how at tradiesbusinessshow.com.